Yeah, uh, so the first thing you need to know about me is that I'm not Graham Cohen. Uh, I did not write BitTorrent. I'm not the founder and CEO of Chia Network. Um, I am the co-founder and former COO, CFO of Storage Labs. I've been working in distributed storage for the last several years. Um, I am a watch collector, ethical software activist, and curry enthusiast. Um, I'm here to talk about Chia Script and all of the terrible things that we're going to do to Bitcoin D as part of this. Um, I've been working with Chia for the last couple months as kind of an engineer and consultant around you know, Bitcoin D and all of the various ways uh, it can uh, really trip you up. So, uh, Bram wanted to talk about proofs of space and time, so I'm going to take questions on that at the end, if you don't mind. Uh, I'm not prepared to give the full pitch because I think right now Bram is the only person in the world who can do that. <laughs> uh, we're working on the knowledge transfer thing. All right, so how many of you have worked with Bitcoin Script? Uh, all right, all right, like three, four people. Um, Bitcoin actually supports a very minimal uh, fourth-like stack-based language in its transactions. Uh, frankly, it kind of sucks. It's really terrible. If you've used fourth, you'll know that. Um, it, it's weird. So, for example, script has the concept of negative zero. Yeah, yeah, it has negative zero. It's different from normal zero. Uh, all the arithmetic is the same, but if you hash zero and hash negative zero, you're going to get different things. Um, Yes. Yeah. All right. So here's, a, here's another way that script is really weird. You have these two operations called bool and and bool or. You'd expect these to be boolean and and boolean or. They're not. They check whether the inputs are empty strings and return a boolean. Uh, so it makes no sense. It's frankly terrible. So script is hard to upgrade. We're stuck with whatever Satoshi gave us. In the past, there have been two major upgrades, Ops CLTV and Ops CSV, which both relate to time locks. And uh, for backwards compatibility reasons, they both have to pretend to be op nops. So that if there's an old client who doesn't understand check lock time verify or check sequence verify, it has to pretend it's a no operation. So for that reason, we have things like this, where you put in the time that you want to lock it for, off check lock time verify, and then off drop. Because check lock time verify reads the stack, but does not pop the argument from the stack. So we need to then drop it from the stack after CLTV has read it. Uh, check sequence verify works the same way, and it's really kind of a pain, and it means that you never see CLTV without off drop immediately after. So one extra useless byte just because we have to maintain backwards compatibility with Satoshi's original script, which is annoying. Um, script is really messy. So for example, opif, you think it's a conditional, but it's not. Um, opif is actually control logic that mutates the stack based on what path the user wants to execute. Um, so Oppick is supposed to take things, you know, copy a stack item to the top of the stack, but it mutates the stack before it does that. It pops a number from the stack and then reads that number down and copies that item to the top of the stack. So Oppick is abjectly terrible. You have to immediately push a number and then pop that number with Oppick. Um, it's just not good. And then you have endif. Endif is not, strictly speaking, the end of the if block. Uh, and if is an actual operation that gets executed and fails your script if it's not after an if somewhere else. Um, you think it's just for control flow, but it's an actual operation that happens and changes things. It's terrible. So Blockstream has been working on simplicity. It's going to fix everything in, in 2025. Like we'll have this beautiful new world where scripts are amazing, easy to write, and it's going to come out in you know, five more years. So, maybe. How do, you, how do you fix this? Like, what do we actually do to improve on-chain scripting? Um, well, we're going to make Chia script, and it's going to be better. Chia script is clear. So, for example, no more negative zero. Uh, we're going to operate on bools, not strings. We're going to not have integer overflows. Uh, one of the other weird things about script is that arithmetic supports four-byte numbers but can result in five byte numbers being put on the stack. So if you accidentally overflow in your arithmetic, 
your future arithmetic operations will error out. Um, anyway, so no more integer overflows, no more negative zero, none of that weirdness. Uh, ChiaScript is versatile. We're going to support more things in better ways. So we're going to change the opif semantics, we're going to have better stack management opcodes, no more oppick, and we're going to use an upgraded signature scheme. So we're completely dropping uh, opcheck sig, opcheck multisig, and the verify versions of those. So ChiaScript's also designed to be upgradable. We're introducing a concept called abort succeed. Uh, in Bitcoin, if you run into an opcode that you don't know, it's pretty much always a knock, and so you do nothing. In ChiaScript, if you run into an opcode that you don't know how to handle, it's going to end script execution and return success. This means that all clients that don't know how to handle an opcode will just punt on it. They won't care. And so in the future, we can replace those opcodes with things that limit behavior in meaningful ways, like we did with opcheck lock time verify in Bitcoin, but we don't need to pair it with an op drop. Um, it means that every unknown opcode, we can just sock, sock it in any functionality that we want to with no worries. And new clients who understand it will enforce that behavior, while old clients won't. Uh, it's the exact situation we have in Bitcoin, but with better semantics at every point. Um, oh yeah, and we're also going to reclaim most opcodes. So, where do we start? Delete <coughs> everything. Uh, data pushes, Bitcoin uses bytes or opcodes 1 through 75 uh, for just pushing data on the stack, and then it has three additional opcodes for pushing that. Uh, push data 1 reads the next one byte and reads that as the number of bytes following that to push onto the stack. We're just going to delete all of those and standardize on push data. Push data is going to read the next bytes as a variable length integer and push that many bytes onto the stack from the string. So we're no longer using just 78 opcodes straight up just for pushing data, we now have one. Um, you don't have to memorize what 1 through 75 is in hex anymore to read Bitcoin scripts. We're just going to have like one opcode that handles all that for you. Um, stack management, uh, let's see, so Bitcoin actually has two stacks in its script, which is a terrible idea. Um, you actually like push things onto the alt stack and pop them off and move them back and forth from the normal stack to the alt stack and it's really a mess and nobody uses this feature because, you know, frankly you can't effectively, humans don't think that way. Um, all the rest of these are for manipulating items on the stack, so like, for example, op2rot takes the first and second stack item and moves them to the fifth and sixth position and moves everything else up. Um, it's really kind of pointless, and so we're going to get rid of all of these. Um, you can keep op depth, like op depth is pretty fine. It reads the stack and pushes a number onto the stack that is how many arguments are below it. So if there are three items on the stack, it's going to push a three. Um, it's actually kind of useful. Uh, op drop is pretty useful too. We want that to keep that, but you know, out of all of these, something like 20 op codes, we're going to keep about two. Um, and uh, all of these crypto operations, uh, we're just going to get rid of them. No. And you, you get to keep SHA-256. That is the only one of those things you should actually be using. I mean, look, we've got SHA-1, RMD-160, and then we have uh, Satoshi's just like weird composed hash functions that don't actually add any benefit. Um, RMD-160 of SHA-256 is not a thing that people should do. That, that's just Satoshi being weird. Um, op code separator is maybe the worst thing anyone ever added to Bitcoin. Uh, it just causes complications with everything and there's entire swaths of the code base that deal with it, uh, like hundreds of lines of the Bitcoin D code base deal with it and we're just gonna delete them because they're a pain in the ass. Excuse me. <laughs> I have strong feelings about this. All right, so you get to keep SHA-256, because that's a reasonable hash function that people what, want to use. Why are you uh, Because we're actually removing ECDSA altogether. What? Uh, I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> Is it quantum computer <laughs> we, we don't know that, though. All right, so double SHA, double SHA is pointless, RMD-160 is pointless, hash-160 is just like a mess. We're just going to trash all of that, and you can use a real hash function that people actually use. Um, 
So what about signatures? Here we go, Tarek. Um, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, so the next thing we do is make things better. We're going to go with MAST first. MAST is an upgrade for Bitcoin scripting language where we take our scripts and build them into Merkle trees. And then we selectively reveal the parts we want to execute. So what this means is that scripts take up less space on chain. You don't end up with all the op if, op end if, messy semantics. You reveal the parts of the script that you want to execute and provide a proof that that is a valid wrap through the script. So we're going to go mask first. And uh, it's just, no, it's a no-brainer. It's a strict upgrade. It improves privacy, scalability, everything. Um, I would highly recommend, if you haven't already, go read the BIPs for uh, tail call semantics and uh, Merkle branch verify. We're going to end up with something similar to that. All right, so we're going to improve all of the opcodes that we're keeping and a bunch of them that we're not. So we're going to just, I talked about op, abort success earlier. We're going to have an opcode that will always be abort succeed. So you can always just return a, subs, a script on a success any at any point in the script if you want to. Um, so it does what it says on the tin. It stops script execution, it returns success, and this is the default behavior for unknown opcodes so that we can upgrade them in the future. So we're adding opcLTD drop and opcSV drop. Uh, they do exactly what they say. It's check lock time verify and drop as one opcode. Uh, the way we would have liked to do it in Bitcoin if we weren't stuck with op not the end. Um, it behaves as check lock time verify or check sequence verify. It pops a stack item instead of just reading a stack item and fixes the annoying op not op drop thing. All right. To replace pick and all of the stack management, we're going to add two new opcodes, which are pull and deref. So these are new ways to read the stack and copy it to the top. So they're going to copy the stack item at a specified index. So every time you pick or deref, the following bytes will be a variable like integer telling you which stack item to copy to the top. Pick indexes from the top of the stack and deref from the bottom of the stack. One of the things you might have noticed about op pull is it becomes extremely difficult when you're referencing from the top of the stack to determine where something is over time. When you're mutating the stack and you want to read the second from the top item, if you keep pushing things, it's going to move down to the fifth position, and you have to remember where it is. However, when you're reading from the bottom of the stack, it stays at a set index. So op deref makes it way easier to reference things that are on the stack and copy them to the top. So when we're doing stack management, op deref and op pull are far better tools than anything Bitcoin gave you. All right, so here's an example. If we have this stack set up on our left, we have the script on our right, we're going to pull the item at index two. So we're going to count from the top of the stack down to this 48 byte pub key, and we're going to copy it to the top of the stack. Then we have deref at one, so we're going to count from the bottom of the stack, the first item, and pull it to the, and copy it to the top of the stack. Um, it's just an easier, better way of doing all of Bitcoin stack management. All right, so I talked earlier about op if being terrible um, and everything about it being bad. Uh, we're <laughs> replacing it with if jump, if n jump, and jump. So these are new flow controls. And what they're going to do is they're going to jump a specific number of bytes. So if the top stack item is truthy or evaluates to true, it's going to jump. If not jump is if the top stack item does not evaluate to true, it's going to jump. And op jump just jumps if you want to do that for some reason. So these are going to replace op if, op else, op end if, everything like that. So here's an example. So we're going to say op if jump 33. Here we go. And so 33 in hex is uh, 51 in decimal. And so we're going to jump over this OX30 byte pub key and these three opcodes. So if this top stack item is true, we're going to jump to here. If this top stack item is not true, we're going to execute this. And then we're going to see this jump and jump over this statement to whatever's after it. Um, 
basically what this does is all the same flow control, except it's immediately obvious where script execution will resume after the jump. You just count forward that many bytes. You don't have to parse an entire Bitcoin script ahead of time in order to see what if branches you're going to execute. Uh, you can quickly, from the length of the script, verify how much computation it's going to take to execute by counting sig ops and things like that. Um, op if is responsible for a lot of the complexity of writing and evaluating Bitcoin scripts, and jumping is going to solve a lot of that. So in this case, if the top stack item is true, we're going to check this pub key against the aggregate signature. If the top stack item is false, we're going to check this pub key against the aggregate signature. So this is a way of doing, uh, in Bitcoin, this would be like op if, pub key, op check, sig verify, op else, pub key, op check, sig verify, op end if. So we're doing this in fewer op codes in a way that's in you know, more clear for static analysis. So I skipped over this, op VLS aggregate. So this is tying back to the signature schemes we talked about or didn't earlier. So what is op VLS aggregate and op VLS aggregate from stack? Um, Chia is going to use a completely different signature scheme called VLS signatures. These have also been called VLS short sigs. They're based not on elliptic curve cryptography, but on pairings-based cryptography. Um, and I'm going to go through that in a second for anyone who likes math. Um, so what we need to know right now is that op BLS aggregate is going to read a pub key from the stack, compute the pairing of the pub key and the message, which I'll get to in a second, and adds it to the aggregation verification queue. One of the great things about VLS signatures is that they can be non-interactively aggregated. You can take any number of VLS signatures and transmit them in the space of one VLS signature. You can just linearly squish these all down into one signature on any number of messages and pub key pairs. And so when we're talking about Chia uh, versus Bitcoin, in Bitcoin, every transaction has a I think 65 bytes uh, ECDSA pub key per input, at least one, potentially many. And then each one has a 33 byte signature. No, sorry, those are backwards. 33 byte pub key, 65 byte signatures in ECDSA. Um, in Chia, every transaction has exactly one aggregated signature. So you take all of those signatures that are taking up a lot of space in the blockchain, squish them down into one thing. Um, and if we extend SegWit a little bit, we can actually have those just hanging off the blockchain, taking up basically no block space ever. Um, so it's kind of a no-brainer to do this for us. Um, op VLS aggregate from stack uh, implements the logic that people want with um, check sig from the stack in Bitcoin. It reads a message and a pub key off the stack computes the pairing, and adds it to the verification queue. Um, this may not make sense yet. Uh, just don't worry about it. We'll, we'll get there. Um, so what are, what are next steps for Chia script? Uh, we're going to be writing, this is one of Ram's pet projects, a Bitcoin to Chia transpiler. So take any Bitcoin script that you have, transpile it to Chia script. Um, all you have to do is swap out the uh, key formats. Um, so for example, we're going to take, this is the exact you know, thing I had on the board earlier. You know, we're talking about op if, pub key, check sig verify, else pub key, check sig, check multi sig verify. We can do that you know, in Chia script with jumps. So this is going to be the exact same semantics, but it's more compact, more concise, and we're going to just transpile your, your old script so that if you like writing in Bitcoin script, you can. Um, so we're going to build some tooling around MAST. I talked about this earlier, but we need some nice you know, command line or debugging tools to merkleize a script, select portions for executions, verify the proofs, provide the inputs to the script, execute it, and debug from command line. This is something that still barely exists in Bitcoin. There's only two debuggers that I know of for Bitcoin script, and they're both kind of terrible. Yeah, buggy. Um, Nobody gets the bool and thing right. 
Um, and so the debuggers don't match the actual Bitcoin D implementation. But frankly, like who would get the bool and thing right? There's absolutely no reason you would read for null strings. It makes no sense. All right. Um, before I dive into BLS, do we have questions about Chia script? Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Info okay, dump. hold on a second. Uh, are you guys writing this stuff out for people to read? Uh, we have internal write-ups, and we're going to be uh, formalizing those and putting them out there. Uh, I've been authoring the chips so far. Yep. Um, so we're going to... What is the release date for the first draft of these things? That's a tough question. <laughs> um, always two months later than we expect. So one of my roles with Jia has been writing these things down while we talk about them, and uh, I'm hoping to get those out to the public within a month or two, but we'll see what happens. How do you guys vote on BLS versus... Versus ECDSA? ECDSA? Yeah. So um, none of us like ECDSA, so that was easy. <laughs> um, the real choice for us was BLS for Schnorr, mm -hmm. and uh, BLS is simpler, easy to, easier to reason about, uh, has the advantage of non-interactive aggregation instead of interactive aggregation. So we can aggregate signatures after the fact instead of forcing users to do it. Um, and uh, BLS gives the shortest signatures of any signature scheme uh, for the uh, security parameter. Um, so for us, it was kind of an easy decision. We explored doing Schnorr and decided it was just a bunch of headaches. So, yeah. One thing I like to do when I see code that causing me to throw things against the wall, is try to understand why it was written that way. Yeah. Um, so you, you listed a bunch of things that you want to throw out. Yep. Um, is it just like good intentions gone awry? Or is there just like fundamental issues with how these comps A bit of both, really. Um, so one of the things I didn't talk about is Bitcoin script has a lot of disabled opcodes. Um, so there's an opcode that's op cat, so it'll take the top two stack items, treat them as strings, and concatenate them. It's been disabled for years because no, you know, Satoshi didn't think it through, and uh, you can just uh, DDoS all other nodes by doing op dupe op cat op dupe op cat ten times. You'll fill up all of their memory with just you know the stack for your Bitcoin script. So there's a bunch of stuff that we're left with because Satoshi did not think it through. Um, he didn't consider the implications of these opcodes, or he didn't consider uh, like good type checking, which is why bool and and bool or happened. Um, so a lot of this is probably he didn't think that this was uh, as important a part of the system as other things. Um, if you actually go look up the list of opcodes, you'll find that about uh, probably 20 to 30% of them are disabled and will never be re-enabled. Yes? Okay, sorry for the agents, but um, this will be on a chain? This will be on a brand new chain. I'm um, curious, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not my department. <laughs> um, so this will be on a brand new chain called GIA, GIA Network. <laughs> It's going to be based on uh, proofs of space and proofs of time, rather than proof of work. And how do you prove space? Very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can cover that at the end. Um, what's, what's the space for? We'll uh, cover it at the end. Yeah. So cover it at the end. Uh, yes. It's probably a dumb question, but if it's going to be on its own chain, why does it need to be? Why do you? Why are you building a Bitcoin transpiler? So that uh, people with existing scripts can move them over easily. Um, so for example, there's a lot of useful scripting being done around like HTLCs, Lightning Network. If we have a transpiler, we can just move all of that over immediately rather than rewriting it from scratch. <coughs> yes? Have you guys thought about balancing, like should we change the scripting or should we change the proof or should we do it all at one go? Like are you throwing everything in the Kitchen sink into this? So we're, we see this as doing the low-hanging fruit, um, ex with the exception of proof of space and proof of time. Most of the changes we're making are things that Bitcoin D, Bitcoin Core would do 
if they were starting fresh. Right. <laughs> um, the, we're not doing like something far out there like simplicity for the scripting language. We're keeping most of the script implementation, the parsing implementation, all of that. We're just changing the op codes to be better. Um, we're not throwing out like the idea of blocks. We're just kind of changing transaction formats and signatures to be better. Um, we're trying not to kitchen sink it, but there may be a little bit of a kitchen sink thrown in there towards the end, depending on how far we get. So, yeah. What do you guys think about, you know, you talk about space and saving space um, in transactions and chain. Do you have a comparison <coughs> idea of like using their first how much space you guys would save versus, you know, current Bitcoin implementations? So, uh, I'll talk about that a bit more in a second, but using our um, aggregate signatures, if you have two inputs in a transaction, you're going to save something like five bytes per transaction. Uh, it scales linear, linearly up from there. Um, so you're saving like 50 something bytes after, you know, for every additional signature um, because you aggregate all of them to one signature. Um, in terms of the script, you're not going to shave off much, maybe a few bytes here and there. Uh, we're going to have um, SegWit mandatory and so uh, the, we get the kind of on-chain but off-chain uh, v-byte thing there, so probably we sh save a bunch of space that way as well. Um, any other questions? Yes? So what's the point of uh, SegWit from scratch? If you're starting from scratch, why do you need, uh, why do you need SegWit? Well, SegWit was just a way to extend uh, with a um, SegWit, to the maximum block size. SegWit wasn't just a way to extend the maximum block size. Um, SegWit is because uh, Satoshi had never done this before, and um, he made a mistake that I think probably everyone would have made if they had never done this before. Um, there's two things that are important to a blockchain. The first thing is the state changes. So what inputs are consumed, what outputs are created. The second thing is the validating information for those state changes. What gives you the right to consume those inputs and create those outputs? And in you know, like Bitcoin from Satoshi onward, all of that information was mixed up together. And what SegWit does is it takes these state changes and the permissions to make those state changes and breaks them apart. And once you've broken them apart, you remove problems like malleability, and uh, you can conceptually separate what the state of the chain is from the entire history of validating the permissions on the chain. And that means that we can take the permissions and put them off somewhere else that isn't on the main blockchain, and we can you know, reduce what goes on the main blockchain to just the state changes that people care about. about. Um, it's that there is a you know, conceptual separation there that Satoshi did not see, and SegWit kind of brings it in line with there's state changes and there's permissions, and we need those separate, otherwise everything gets really messy. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes? Um, does this shift to, to GeoScript? I don't know, it might be a little too soon, but uh, like you, you think it's good support or simplicity? Um, you know, I probably. Uh, there's going to be some differences because of things like the signature algorithm. Um, we'll, we'll see exactly what happens in a few years. I'm, I'm not joking. Uh, simplicity is going to be years out at this point. Um, I, I like simplicity. Anyone who likes Haskell will like simplicity, but uh, it's years out. All right. Um, I'm going to... Yes. Apologies if you've already covered that, but is there going to be a cost if it is a code script? No. So <coughs> one of the design goals of Bitcoin script and GeoScript is that they're amenable to static analysis so that you can tell how, much, how many resources it will consume before you run it. In Bitcoin script and in GeoScript, you can do this very easily by counting the number of signature operations that you're going to execute. And because you know that we can keep it you know, very bounded, and you don't need a cost because we can make sure that we don't run scripts that are too expensive. Or you, you know, in most cases, you can't write scripts that are too expensive.
Um, any, I'm going to move on to VLS. This might get a little math heavy for a bit, so I hope everyone is Already. comfortable. <laughs> Strapped in. Um, all right. So VLS is a signature scheme named after the three mathematicians who came up with it about 10 years ago. Um, it's Dan Bonet, uh, shoot, I forgot who was uh, Bonet, Lynn, Shaco. Um VLS is based on pairings. And I'm going to cover a bit of like theory background here for a second. Uh, in computer science, we have a few fundamental information problems. So for example, the computational Diffie-Hellman problem. So in a cyclic group, like uh, all the integers modulo a large prime number, um, if you know g to the x, can you compute x? And in basically every cyclic group that we work with, we assume computational Diffie-Hellman is very hard. We assume that it reduces to something called the discrete logarithm problem, which we assume is very hard. So <clears throat> there's a number of statements of this. This is one of the formalizations is if you know g to the x and g to the y, can you compute g to the x, y? And the answer is no, basically never. Um, there's a variation of this called the decisional Diffie-Hellman. If you know in a cyclic group g to the x and h to the y, some other number, can you decide whether x and y are the same? Can you tell if two numbers have been raised to the same exponent? And usually the answer is no, you can't do that. Um, BLS uses something called the co-decisional Diffie-Hellman problem. So with two cyclic groups, if you know a, a to the x, b, and b to the y, where a is in this group and b is in that group, can you tell if x is equal to y? And so BLS uses something called a pairing to make the computational Diffie-Hellman problem hard in both groups, the decisional problem hard in both groups, but the co-decisional problem easy. And so then, what we can do, oh, and uh, ECDSA Schnorr relies on computational Diffie-Hellman being hard in elliptic curve groups. Um, there we go, caught up to myself. All right, so what we can do is we can define a special function called a bilinear mapping. The bilinear mapping is a function, and you don't have to worry about what it does. I have no idea what it does. Um, all it does for practical purposes is create a special function that has this incredibly special property, where you have a to the x and b to the y is equal to a and b to the y to the x. So this takes an element from the first group, an element from the second group, maps them into a third group that lives off over there somewhere. And this function has the special property that moving around exponents doesn't matter. It doesn't change the result. And don't worry about how that works. Um, it's some kind of magic math with uh, embedded elliptic curves and extension towers that maybe I'll understand someday. Um, but the, the upshot here is that we can move exponents around. It doesn't matter. And that means that we can create a really nice signature scheme where we can determine whether two exponents are the same. So here's the BLS signature scheme. We're going to create a random private key that's an element of integers mod some large prime p. Um, we use B12381, which uses a 381-bit prime for p. Uh, actually, 256-bit prime for p, actually. So x is some 256-bit number. It doesn't matter what. It's a secret. And then we're going to take the generator point, which is just some random point on curve two that we agree on all together, and we raise it to the power of our private key. And that's our public key. Our public key is a point on curve two. Our private key is a number. So we're going to, uh, when we want to sign a message, we're going to hash it and map it to a point on the curve. So this is some hash function like SHA-256, don't use RMD-160, it's just a bad idea. Don't use hash-256 or Satoshi's whatever. We're going to take that hash 
and we're going to translate it into a point on the first curve. So our pub key is on the second curve, our message is a point on the first curve, and then to compute the signature, we're going to take the hash of our message and raise it to the power of our private key. So then for verification, we check that the pairing of our signature and the generator point on curve two is equal to the pairing of the hashed message and our pub key, or the other person's pub key. So here's verification broken down a bit. We've said already that we can move exponents around in the pairing, it doesn't matter. So we say that, you know, we're pairing our signature with the generator point, and we're pairing the message with our pub key. We already said that the signature is just the message to the power of our private key. And our pub key is the message, is the generator point to the power of our private key. So we're checking whether uh, the hash to x and g2 is equal to the hash and g2 to the x. So we're just checking that this relationship holds. And we know from earlier when we defined our mapping that that relationship should hold if those two x's are the same and should not hold if they are different numbers. So what that means is we can efficiently check whether two exponents are the same without computing the exponent. So my private key stays private, my public key is public, and you can use my public key to verify my signature on any message. All right, um, before we move on, do you have any more questions? Any clarification I can go with here? This is, uh, this is actually some of the simpler algebra that I've worked on recently. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry if I'm moving a bit quickly. Um, yes? How long has it been around and how confident are you guys that there's no? So this has been around for almost 10 years. Um, it's provably secure with one additional assumption. Um, and basically what that means is uh, Peter Woolley will like raise some uh, concerns about the one additional assumption, but other than that, it's totally fine. Nobody else cares. Um, so it's been around for a number of years. The problem that we're going to run into is hardened implementations. So the reason everybody uses ECDSA is that the implementations have been around, constantly developed, and all of the bugs have been fixed over the last 20 years. Schnorr has been developed over the last like five to 10 years, and this has only been implemented uh, over the last like four or five years. Um, so it's not about the security assumptions of the scheme, it's about the implementations and how hard we can make one in the time we can we have. Uh, was there another question over? Pretty much the same. How well tested is it? Yeah. Um, so we're actually using the same curve that Zcash is using for their new uh, powers of tau and the new snark setup. Um, so the Zcash curve is going to be getting a lot of attention, and we're probably going to be moving to that one at some point in the future. Or the Zcash. <coughs> the Zcash implementation is going to be very well tested. And we'll probably end up moving to that implementation and uh, standardizing around it and pouring resources into verifying it. So there's two curves to decide, right? You're using the same two curves? Well, there, there's actually, you, you basically get a choice of paired curves. Okay. So there's two curves, but you only get one choice if you, you choose a pair. Yeah. Yeah. You don't get to choose just any two curves. We have to choose two very special curves that you can build this special mapping. Um, so in terms of like security level, we're using uh, 12381, which has 128 bits of security, give or take. Um, ECDSA signatures have about 100 bits of security right now. Um, maybe a little less. All right. So I'm going to move on to signature aggregation. This is the neat trick I mentioned earlier, where we can take any number of signatures from other people and roll them all up into one signature. 
uh, very, very easily. So this is all the same. Um, we're just going to say that you know now we have I partic you know n participants, and this is uh, private key zero, private key one, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're going to generate hub keys the same way. We're going to hash things the exact same way. We're going to sign them the same way, and then we're going to aggregate them just by multiplying the signatures together. Um, it's really easy. You just multiply the curve points. Um, so you're just taking all of these points on G1 and multiplying them together. You get a single point at the end. And the way we're going to verify is we're going to check that the product, so this is pi down here, of the aggregated signatures, and G2, is equal to the product of all of the pairings of messages and pub keys. So the pairing of message one and pub key one, the pairing of message two and pub key two, all multiplied together. So we're going to, all right, so breaking it down a little bit, we're going to check that the mapping of one, you know, signature one and signature two multiplied together with G2 is equal to the product of the mapping of hash one and pub key one and the mapping of hash two and pub key two. So, you know, this is the same relationship we saw earlier where we're just moving the exponents around to verify. Um, if you want to go through and do more algebra to like check that, go be my guess. Uh, we're basically just moving these outside the parentheses. So VLS has a few limitations. Um, actually, any questions on aggregated signatures? Yeah? Are you talking about aggregated signatures per transaction or for the entire transaction? That's an implementation question. Okay. Um, so op BLS aggregate, which I talked about earlier, what it's going to do is it's going to compute this mapping and cache it and then uh, verify the signature when it does that, which should be super easy. But essentially, it's going to add these to a cache so that we could aggregate across an entire transaction or across an entire block pretty easily. Um, all you need is the cached mappings and the aggregated signature for that you know, level. We're kind of seeing this as across transactions right now until we get like a better model for blocks. Uh, but we'll kind of see where that ends up. The space savings of having exactly one signature per block is pretty big, but there's limitations around uh, once you've aggregated, you can't unaggregate. Uh, so if you want to verify the signature on a particular message, you're going to need to transmit the entire block and the entire block's aggregated signature instead of just the single transaction you care about. So yeah, that seems to imply that you can't necessarily incrementally aggregate to say that you're at this signature, we want to add one more. Um, you can incrementally, incrementally aggregate. So like, uh, think about multiplying numbers. One yeah. times two times three times five is yeah. the same as one times two times three times five. Uh, but it's hard to go backwards. And this goes back to like elliptic curve math and the pairing operation and stuff is uh, one of the reasons we say that computational Diffie Hellman is hard in these groups is because it's very hard to divide numbers in these groups. It is computationally cheaper to multiply than to divide by a pretty wide margin. Okay. So that also continues to say that you can have the incremental kind of check can be done fast and then you can also have a harder check that's done. To right, say right. This entire chain we can now do more. Yes, yeah. So you can cache all these pairings. You can verify chunks of them against an aggregated signature. Yeah. Uh, you can verify all of them. You can, um, and this, yeah. as long as you're caching the signatures that you see and caching the pairings on the other side, you can act, you know verify any chunk of signatures against any chunk of message of key pairings. Um, this gets into like implementation stuff around when do you cache those? How long do you keep them? How do you communicate these to other nodes who haven't seen the entire block? That kind of thing. Uh, yes. So the assumption here is that a miner creating a block with a thousand transactions is going to aggregate all the signatures for all the thousand transactions into a single signature for the block? Uh, potentially, yeah. Um, right now, we're probably going to start by implementing transaction level aggregations. 
uh, but they're not interactive. So I could batch up five transactions as a unit, aggregate five signatures into one signature for those five transactions, move those around as a chunk. Um, we can go anywhere from you know one signature to one message to uh, one signature for the entire block. And you can aggregate up, but it's hard to de-aggregate. And I don't think you can de-aggregate securely. Anyways, um, so problems. More assumptions, fewer implementations. We already talked about this. Uh, hub keys in DLS are 96 bytes. I mentioned earlier that ECDSA signatures are 65 bytes, and ECDSA hub keys are 33 bytes. You might notice that uh, 33 plus 65 is uh, just barely more than 96. So when we're aggregating signatures in our script, uh, back in script land, we had the pub keys on the stack, and then we're running op BLS aggregate on them. So what that means is uh, if we do it that way, we're not actually saving space until we aggregate 24 signatures, and then you break even. And that's kind of problematic because not many transactions have 24 inputs or 24 signatures on them. So pub keys are revealed on chain. This is the same as ECDSA, uh, but it leads to that problem where if pub keys are revealed on chain and the pub key is only two bytes smaller than ECDSA's signature plus pub key, like, we don't actually get savings. So uh, we came up with a solution, um, reverse BLS. It's identical to regular BLS, except the message is on curve two and the pub key is on curve one. So what that means is we're doing all the same math, except we're swapping what curves things are on. So the signature is on G2 and the pub key is on curve one, right? Um, I hope you all at least have like, decided not to understand this by now, <laughs> because it's the exact same stuff we went over with a slight flip. Um, so verification is exactly the same. We're going to compute the mapping of pub key and message, and the mapping of generator point and signature, and verify that they're equal. So now, pub keys are 48 bytes, and signatures are 96 bytes. So uh, that looks much better. So now, we need just one signature per TX, or potentially in the future, one 96-byte signature per block. Uh, that seems like a pretty nice space savings. It starts at two inputs, or you get significant space savings over any multi-sig setup. Because ECDSA multi-sig, you have to push every pub key to the stack, and it's a pain. So by using reverse BLS, we overcome the main limitation of BLS, which is the long pub keys. And before anyone asks, yes, we checked this by the authors of the BLS paper. Yes, we're allowed to do this. No, it won't break the security. Um, all right, so that's the end of my slides. How long have you been working on this new script architecture? Um, on the new script? Well, I mean, yes, like, this is a lot. Uh, not too long. <laughs> a couple weeks. Um, I mean, all the script stuff is super low-hanging fruit. It's you know all no-brainers. Uh, script is a mess, and everybody knows it, which is why we want to move to simplicity. Um, we've been checking a lot of our changes or proposed changes by Bitcoin Core developers or other people who worked on Bitcoin D. Um, you know, we're trying to make the things that are really obvious. Uh, yes. Uh, is there any library using BLS? Are you going to use it or implement your own? Um, so there are implementations of the elliptic, of the like pairing math and the uh, operations on the different groups. So we essentially have to build a implementation of BLS using the underlying algebra. Um, so pairing is implemented. The scalar multiplication and the point multiplication are implemented. We just now have to uh, go out and put all the plumbing in place. Yes. Thank you. This is super cool. Can you share a little bit about the roadmap for the Chia project? Um, it's really up in the air right now, and mostly depends on what Graham feels like working on at the time. 
Uh, we're still in a lot of the design phase. We're working on an implementation of BLS, of reverse BLS. Um, that's progressing nicely. Uh, we're mostly in design phase for script changes, for proof of work changes, for everything else. Does that mean you're looking for engineers? Um, I believe they are. I'm not, not my department. <laughs> so, yeah. You want to give us a little bit about space and time? <laughs> sure. I don't have any slides for this. Um, so I guess the... Uh, do you have the B-Pace slides on your screen? I, I do have the B-Pace <laughs> slides around here somewhere, I think. But uh, I don't find them very helpful, is the problem. Graham and I do not you build... Just that. <laughs> Graham and I do not build slides the same way. Let's see if we can actually get anything useful out of <laughs> You have a point. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Um, see, like, this just doesn't help anybody. Um, okay, okay. Let's see. Function inversion for proof of space. All right. I think this is probably the most relevant thing. So essentially the way the proof of space works is we're trying to invert a function and we're just gonna not worry about what that function is exactly. Um, and so there's something called Hellman's time-space trade-off, which is for most functions, you can add you know, additional bits of information to reduce the computation time, which means that you, know, you can trade off more space stored on your side for less computation done later. Um, what we're trying to do with the proof of space is adjust that trade-off curve from linear you know, here to something a little more bumpy and get out into this area where we can adjust time and space trade-offs. And so the core of the idea is to build a function where the quickest way to compute it, or rather the only <coughs> quick way to compute it, is just to build a lookup table and fill up your hard drive with lookup tables. Um, and so when we're talking about a proof of space, you have a lookup table for this function that's been combined with your public key. Uh, anytime you want to compute a proof of space, you get a challenge, you look up your table, you see if you have a good proof there, and if you do, you submit it to the network, if you don't, you don't. Um, the core idea here is that there is no way to compute this function faster than someone with a lookup table. And it's so much slower that you're not going to be able to compute <coughs> in making a blockchain. It's much longer than the block time. So if you're computing on the fly, anyone who has a lookup table is going to beat you. So people will make lookup tables. And we'll fill up every available hard drive with lookup tables. Um, what's, the, what's the value of all the space? Well, Besides that I'm filling it. What's the value of all the work uh, done by proof of work? Um, we're consuming a resource that can't be faked, essentially. You so can't, instead of buying GPUs, I'm going to be buying hard drives. Or you're just going to be using hard drives you have lying around. And what happens when space becomes so cheap that everybody's just buying more and more of it? Well, the same thing that happened when ASICs became so prevalent that uh, our hash rate you know, went hockey stick for a while. Difficulty adjusts on the network. And is there any possibility of making the space useful for storage for other things? Um, not if you wanted to run a consensus algorithm. Uh, if you don't want to run a consensus algorithm, go ahead and use it for other things. Um, no, no, I want to run the algorithm. Just okay. If I can, you know, eventually this will be the cloud storage server that people use. Mm, probably, you know, we're just storing random lookup tables on here. It's going to be functionally indistinguishable from random bytes. <coughs> You're not going to be using, you know, this is a cloud storage service. You're going to be consuming resources in a way that is provable, you know, computationally. Um, so the contention is that that lookup table has to occupy your hard drive. Yeah. You can't fit anything else on there. Not that you can't fit anything else on there. Okay. Uh, that in space. order to put additional things on there, you have to drop parts of the lookup table. Yeah. So you're dedicating the unused, you know, for whatever you use on your hard drive. You're dedicating the unused that would normally just be unformatted or formatted space that you're not using for anything. So at that point, the time competition becomes not who can compute to who can look up, but rather who can build the fastest lookup. Um, lookup is done in linear time and only needs to, not lookup, uh, 
come. The creation of the go. lookup table is done at the beginning in linear time. Lookups are just a like uh, something like a hundred byte random read from your disk. So it's not going to be like very advantageous to fill up to build faster access. Because what matters is not you know fast access, it's the strength of the proof that is there. Um, like in Bitcoin, where the strength of the proof of work is defined by the leading zero bits of the hash, um, you have the same thing where the strength of the proof is defined by some characteristic of the proof. And so different proofs have varying quality, and if your proof is not quality, you won't bother submitting it to the network. What it's not about if theoretically a single node has all of the tables. <laughs> has all of the tables, yeah. um, you may not have a good proof in your lookup table. Um, like the quality of the proof is compared to the difficulty on, you know, in the block header, same way as in Bitcoin. And so if you don't have a good enough proof at the right spot in your lookup table, you just, you know, won't submit a block. You just don't get a block then, time around. Maybe there's a disconnect here. Um, you're not crawling over the whole lookup table yeah. to find something. You're looking at a specific index yeah. at each block, defined by a challenge a number. Value. What's that? It's effectively a key value. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you're looking at a specific value of each block based on a challenge which comes from the previous block. Yeah. So I'm just kind of getting into like key values are cheap. If it's if you can easily partition it, at that point you can separate the lookup, and it's really easy to actually have almost an infinitely sized database with this information. Um, well, you can't have a database larger than your physical storage medium. Like, well, if it's, can I just be plugged in hard distributed. Well, if it's distributed, then it's just going to be up to the sum of the disks it's distributed onto. Yeah. The size of the lookup table doesn't matter. It's what's at a specific index in that lookup table. Um, you could put it across like a RAID array, you could put it on a single yeah. disk, okay. it shouldn't matter. It's gigabytes or gigabytes. Uh, yes? So at the higher level, the motivation is to create a more fair mining environment mm -hmm. to save power? Uh, create a more fair mining environment, uh, create something that uh, its optimization has more positive externalities, create something that consumes electricity, hopefully, um, there, there's debate about whether you can ever, you know, consume fewer resources and still have a consensus algorithm with Nakamoto consensus. Um, anyways, yeah, make something that is hopefully more decentralized, uh, better positive externalities, that kind of thing. Uh, yes. Um, you use the phrase uh, quality of proof. So you right. either have that particular value at Index or not, so what's the quality of proof? Um, so I don't know exactly how Bram is defining quality. I expect it'll be something like leading zero bits or some other you know quality of the value at that point in the key value store. Um, so there's a special thing for us where proof of space has some weaknesses that we're not going to go into as a consensus algorithm. Um, so combining it with proof of time helps fix those, and because you have two different proof processes. The difficulty is adjusted towards the product of those two proofs. Um, and that means that as time progresses, proofs increase in effective quality. Or the required quality for a successful proof of space goes down over time, is a better way of saying it. Is, is, the, is proof of time another word for proof of work, or is it something like that? I'll get back to that in a second. I'm going to switch gears into the proof of time oh, okay. in a second. Sorry. Uh, yes. So uh, do you pre-compute the key, uh, key value pairs? Yeah. And if no one contains a like, value for a particular key, then you have to actually perform the execution? Um, if you don't have a value for that key, you just won't do anything. If no one? If no, no It's not that there's a globally shared key value store. It's that your hard drive is using a key value store that is unique to you, and you are checking what's at specific indexes in your key value store. Um, and so if there's something good at that index, 
provided that you have that index at all, you'll submit that as a proof to the network and fill the block. And how do you decide on like a particular petition or this lookup table that you want to store? The idea here is that you can actually do this before you ever install anything on the drive. You uh, calculate the lookup table across the entire drive, the, the whole thing, and then deallocate all the space and use raw disk reads from there. And so at that point, you know, you just kind of uh, add files like normally to your file system and they just cover up lookup tables and delete it over time. And uh, when you want to create a proof, you see if you still have that key value and then what the value is and then you know, if you're good enough to build the block. Uh, yes? Would a reasonable analogy be uh, everyone who's participating is committing to a really large bingo card? Yeah, bingo and cards next, is a good way of thinking about the it. next block is saying this, look yep. there, and then you prove that the one you committed to earlier really is bingo. And if nobody has bingo in five minutes, the standard bumps down one or a new square. Yeah, um, is, is that's a, I think a really good way of looking at it is you have you know your bingo card that is your hard drive. And you know every time a block is produced, there's a challenge, and you see if you have a bingo or not. And if you think you do, you, you know, get up and wave it around. And over time, you know, the quality of you know bingo required goes down kind of with time linearly. Um, so yeah, I think bingo cards is a good way of looking at it. You create your bingo card once at the start, and then you wait until you have a bingo. Yes. So, does, so assuming that somebody produces a block, they will include what uh, value? Or proof they used right. to do that, and right. everybody across the network are uh, seeing that and they <coughs> say, okay, for the previous challenge, this was the most valid, valid proof of quality proof, right? And then that becomes the head of the block. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's going to be some complications around reorgs and stuff like that. Uh, Bram is going to talk about that more in the future, hopefully, because that's still up in the air a lot. Um, all right, moving on to proofs of time. I've been trying to convince people to call them poets, proof of elapsed time. Um, it, <laughs> essentially, this is actually really simple conceptually. All we need is a function that's faster to verify than it is to compute. Um, and then you, know, you compute that function over and over as your proof of time, and you then can verify it over and over as the verification of the proof. So we use this, we use a, uh, or what we're planning on using right now and haven't implemented yet is modular square roots. So we'll find the square root of a number in a large you know, uh, prime order field in a cyclic group, right? So you can compute this in you know, a set number of operations. It should take you log of n squared, where n is the size of the group. Um, and you can verify it in log of n time. So there's a linear speed up for verification compared to computation. It's nice. Um, the real trick here is that you can uh, create a snark for the verification. Um, and if you create a snark for the verification, then you can verify the proof in constant time rather than log of the uh, order of the field. Um, so, you know, we're creating this function that's faster to verify than to compute, and then we're making a nice little cryptographic trick to make the computation, the verification extremely quick, not the computation. Um, so one of the really cool things here is you can then combine those snarks into a tree of efficiently computable snarks, and uh, have one snark that verifies any number of computations of modular square roots. Um, and so you can have one proof for any amount of elapsed time, essentially. And so the idea here is that this function is very simple to optimize. You expect to see people get to the fastest version very, you know, very soon after release. And maybe it gets asic for a slight speed up, but it's not a big deal if so. And from that point on, these proofs are generated at a constant set rate. And so you know that 10 computations of this modular square root takes a specific amount of real world time. Because it is impossible to speed it up any faster than that without having something like 
10 to the 15th processors, which is a lot of CPUs. Um, so that means that you can use this proof and the one snark that you verify in constant time, regardless of the number of proofs, uh, to prove that time has elapsed a certain amount since we started doing this. Does that make sense? And so is everyone doing that? So probably not. In order to move on to the next um, lower level of proof of space? You're, you're more likely to see people, um, a few people running proof of time and sharing it with the network. Okay. And all of those people will move at about the same rate because they're all optimized. And it shouldn't be hard to find someone you know, like generating time proofs for you. Um, it's hard to say exactly what the mechanics will be there because we're still in kind of design phase for this. All you need is one optimized implementation out on the network somewhere. Are you implying that you're going to split a blackboard between a, somebody with space and somebody with time? I do not know. Are you guys going to talk to blackboards and time? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yep, yep. Uh, we've been thinking about it. Every block needs a proof of space and a proof of time in it in the current conceptualization, and this is where I'm going to get ahead of myself, and I should let Grant talk about it. Yes? Could you have consensus with just proof of time? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, I wouldn't, but that's kind of an open question. That's really Definity's idea, sort of, um, is a stable random beacon as the root of consensus. Not something I've looked into much. One last question. Dig deep. <laughs> yeah. well, privacy implications? How, how private is it? Blockchain? Um, better than the at least as private job? as Bitcoin. Hmm. That's not very private. Um, if you're, if you're, if you're, I forget what you use the term, but if you're making everything into one, what did you say you're doing? When you're, aggregating. What? Aggregating. Yes, when you're aggregating everything, doesn't you can't unaggregate it. Doesn't that kind of erase the trail? So the pub keys are still committed to on chain and still associated with the inputs and then you commit to a script for the output. So the trail is still there. The signatures aren't the important part. Um, potentially you could use aggregate signatures to do non-interactive point joins and things like that. So there might be some room for privacy there, or privacy gains there, but it's hard to say exactly what that'll look like. That's it. Wow, thank you, James. James, thank you so much. This was super awesome. This is probably one of the more engaged uh, discussions we've had afterwards. Obviously, everyone is super interested in this. You guys, thank you for your amazing questions. We are going to be meeting in uh, Brick House across the street. And stay tuned. We will have Bram uh, come and speak because he owes us one. Uh, so I'll see you across the street. Thank you. Thank you.